Now the mortgage offer and the mortgage deed are two items created by the lender, the product provider of course. Now they use lawyers to do the mortgage deed, uh, but they themselves do the mortgage offer. Now the mortgage deed is, there's a template created of course by the lender and they give that to the conveyancer to, uh, to do the legal work for them. But let's go back a few steps. So you've applied for a mortgage and it's all gone through. So you've done all the surveys, you've done all the checks and credit ch checks, all those things. And the lender says, yes, you can have it. You know, you can have your mortgage. The lender say yes, computer says yes, kind of thing. And the first thing they do of course is they issue you with the mortgage offer. Now the mortgage offer, which is my little picture over here, is a um, report, a PDF in paper as well, sent to the customer in order for them to get confirmation that they've been accepted for the mortgage. It's pretty much that really. The first part of the mortgage offer, here's page one if you like. This gives you details about the loan, um, the interest rate, the amount they're lending to you. Uh, they give you like a six month kind of waiting period, a six month mortgage offer. There's the um, binding mortgage offer now as well, uh, which effectively gives you a seven day reflection period, which is pretty much where the lender just keeps quiet for seven days while you reflect, man, on your mortgage offer. And if you don't like it, you don't have to accept it, but you know, you could do that anyway, can't you? So it's kind of like a binding offer on behalf of the, uh, of the lender. Um, not much more to say about the front page. It just gives you details about the mortgage really that you've applied for and the fact that they're saying yes to the amount, the term, that sort of thing, the, the method of repayment, that sort of thing is all confirmed. Now the, the important thing about the mortgage offer though is it does have a number of special conditions. Now special conditions are unique to the particular case. Now it has a lot of standard conditions already uh, pre-printed. Yeah, I'll put that in there for you standard conditions already pre-printed in the uh, the mortgage offer. These are things like, you know, the expiry date, that sort of thing. But the special conditions are unique to the client and unique to the property. So for example, it may have some work needed doing to the property. It might be a retention on the property or an undertaking that's required to do some works to the property. That might be a requirement. It could be any other type of condition. For example, it might be somebody over the age of 17 who's living in the property. You know, the teenage son, for example. And because uh, he's going to like turn 18 shortly, he will have a majority. Of course, he will reach the adulthood 18. Therefore, the lender will be a bit worried about having him in the property and not partaking to the mortgage. So they'll get him to sign a consent to mortgage form, which pretty much overrides his rights to live there if they have to repossess. So that's the, uh, these are special conditions, that's all they are. And there's a number of them. And a good mortgage uh, broker will go through those with the client. What you should do, of course, is the mortgage offer meeting. You should run a video meeting for 15 minutes where you just go through the mortgage offer with the client. Because sometimes they need explaining stuff. And don't do it face to face, don't you, for that. But get online, get on video, share the mortgage offer, talk it through and they will be extremely happy. And this is the time, by the way, that the mortgage advisor, mortgage broker, that's when she can obtain a testimonial from the client with your trust pilot or your uh, bias or whatever it is you use, vouched for whatever site you use for your reviews. You should get them at the mortgage offer meeting because the, the client just loves you to bits because they've had their mortgage offer, haven't they? So that's pretty much all there is to say about the mortgage offer. Now, the big one, is the mortgage deed. So what happens now, of course, is the mortgage offer is sent to the applicant, the mortgage offer is sent to the lawyer, who then starts to process the mortgage side of the legal work. They're doing the conveyancing of the property, of course they are, but the lender is now instructing them to do the legal work for them. The client has to pay for it, but the lender obviously is the one that instigates this legal work. Now part of that legal work is for the lawyer to draw up what they call the mortgage deed. Now the mortgage deed is the contract. This is the legal contract, uh, the, the legal charge, if you like, that sets up the mortgage on the property that the client wants to buy. And this mortgage deed is the most important thing ever invented by lenders, because this gives them tons of rights, as you can see here, and makes the borrower do tons of things, promises or covenants. And this really creates the mortgage itself. A lot of people think the mortgage is the, you know, the loan on the property. It's not. The mortgage is the legal charge, which allows the loan on the property to be secured against the property. 
And if they don't pay up, they can have the property back. So the mortgage deed itself then has got quite a lot going on. And I need to talk through these with you in a little bit of detail, really, because um, you need to understand them. The client might ask you to go through them. The lawyer is supposed to, but they do it really quickly because they're not really paid to go through it. You are, and you should do this, of course, on completion. Now, let's have a look at the borrower's covenants. These are promises that the borrower must 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 keep to otherwise they could lose the property and there's a number of these of course they've got to maintain payments they've got to make sure they keep up to, up to date with their payments that makes sense isn't it i don't need to say much more about that one they have to keep the property in good repair good repair now i remember years ago when i was a building society manager up in london assistant manager i was and once a month we used to go around and have a look at our properties that we had on the mortgage books and it's great day out because you went to spend the day in the manager's car and i had binoculars and i used to go around looking at the properties to see if they were in good nick and seriously it's what we did <laughs> we had to check nowadays they don't bother do they they just make sure that the client keeps it in good repair um you're not to sublet without permission now they, they include lodgers as well but you know if you're going to rent the property out with short hold tenancy all that stuff you need to get permission from the lender a lot of people don't bother i get that um, my mate next door he's not my mate he's my neighbor he he rents his place out as an airbnb i bet you he hasn't asked permission from his borrower his lender for that but you're not to sublet you have to comply with all law that's uh, that's relevant here obviously property conditions, property covenants, the law of the land, the law of the area, the covenants laid down by the local authority. You have to comply with all those as well. It makes sense, doesn't it? And that includes the property covenants that goes with the property. You know, thou shalt not keep chickens, that sort of thing. And you have to make sure you observe the leasehold conditions. If there is a leasehold, in other words, if you have a flat and it's leasehold, you have to adhere to the lease conditions. And if you don't, then the lender can actually take over and make sure you do. Um, otherwise, there could be a forfeiture of the lease, which could, of course, you could lose your property and the lender would lose their security as well. And the other big one is you must insure the property, the bricks and mortar of the property, that is, the building's insurance. So there's quite a lot of um, conditions that you have to... Um, adhere to and you've probably read all sorts of stories that go on in mortgage properties and if any of these conditions are not met then the lender has the right to take over either doing the condition or take over the property so for example if the property is not in good repair the lender has the right to repair it and charge the cost to the mortgage deed if the property's not been insured the lender has the right to insure the property and charge the cost to the mortgage account so that's covenants the big one though are the rights that the lender has the lender has a lot of rights so let's go for go through those for you first of all they have the right to call in the mortgage at any time they want they don't actually have to wait for you to not pay your mortgage payment they can call in the mortgage at any time that they want. They don't, of course not. We can imagine the press picking this up. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Brown were evicted for no fault of their own, you know, kind of thing. It's not going to happen, but it, but it could happen in, in theory. They have the right to make charges to the mortgage account, such as arrears charges, um, insurance charges, that sort of thing. They have the right to, to put charges against the mortgage account as well. They also, of course, have the right to insure the property if you don't. And that's where you get block policies. The block policy is the great big insurance policy that um, covers a number of the, uh, the mortgages or the properties that the lender has on their books. That's insuring the property. Um, they have to meet legal requirements and all those good things, of course. They have the right to let the property. So if they are the um, mortgagee in possession, if they repossess the property and the property ain't worth selling this moment, so they can let it out to make some income. And that income, of course, can then be used to pay off the mortgage arrears. They have the right to let the property, which is quite interesting, isn't it? They also have the right to consolidate. Now, this confuses lots of people when they read this. They have the right to consolidate the mortgages held by the client. Now, some clients might have several mortgages with one lender, particularly buy-to-let landlords. They might have two or three mortgages on two or three different properties. Now, the lender has the right, if they want to, to consolidate all of the mortgages into one and all of the securities into one, which means that if the client wants to redeem one mortgage, 
then the lender can actually force them to redeem all of the mortgages all at the same time. And that might be useful if they're worried about one security, for example, being worth less than the mortgage itself. And therefore they might say, look, if you're going to sell that property, we want you to sell every property and pay off every mortgage because in combination, all of your properties adds up to the mortgages. But that one over there, that property is worth less than your mortgage. That's called consolidation. And that's a right that they have as well. They also have the right to transfer the mortgage. Here you go. They transfer them. Remember, the mortgage, by the way, is not the house or the loan. The mortgage is the legal charge. And they have the right to transfer the legal charge to another provider. Now, they have that right. <laughs> they don't need your permission for that. Now, it happened to us. We took out a mortgage six years ago with um, Metro Bank, which was rather lovely. Now, a few years later, Metro Bank transferred the mortgage to NatWest because they can and they did. And we suddenly had a mortgage with NatWest, which suited us because NatWest is a really good lender. And um, that's something they have the right to do. Um, what they're doing there, of course, is they're not um, packaging it up into a mortgage-backed security and selling it on, which a lot of specialist lenders do. What they're doing there is they're literally selling the mortgage book to NatWest. And they would have sold a couple of a couple of billion, I'd have thought, it depends on how much money they had involved, a couple of billion mortgage book to NatWest, who would have paid money to Metro who could then relent it or use it for whatever purposes. And suddenly NatWest have got themselves like a thousand mortgages with mortgage clients, mortgage accounts, without doing any marketing work or having people selling them. So that's a pretty good deal as far as they're concerned. That's called transferring the mortgage itself. Remember, it's not putting it into a mortgage-backed security and putting it out for sale. That's a very different type of thing. We talk about that in other videos as well. Um, they have all the legal remedies as well. They got a legal remedies. That means they have the Law of Property Act 1925 and the various abilities to repossess the property if the person doesn't pay it, get, get a possession order from the county courts and repossess the property. So they've got lots of rights there as well. So as you can see, the lender's got quite a lot of uh, rights here, which, you know, they're lending you big bucks, so they should have. And you've got a lot of promises you've got to keep. So it's a bit of a one-sided thing, this mortgage contract, but hey, that's what it's about. Don't forget to spend some time with your client going through those things because they will value that information that you're giving them. And it will mean that when you do a review six months later, 12 months later, they'll be happy to keep you as uh, their, their mortgage and protection advisor. And that's, of course, what you want to be doing. So that really endeth the mortgage deed and the mortgage offer. Hope that's been useful.